Hello. Welcome to Nice Tuesdays. I'm so glad that I looked at everybody when I wasn't blinded by the light, because <laughs> I said to Ollie, this is such an amazing audience. I actually, um, I was a bit peckish earlier, and I went across the road to Mangal 2, the restaurant. Yeah. And um, I watched you guys all queuing up to get in. And I thought, wow, these look like really beautiful, lovely people. And I'm so happy that they're queuing up to come and see us have a chat. Yeah. And now you can't see them at all. So, yeah. so thank you for coming. <laughs> yeah. Um, how are you doing? Thank you so much for, for joining us here tonight. I'm going to unrobe. I thought I was going to be really cold. But it's a the weird warmth, room. The warmth, of, the warmth of the audience is, is warming me up. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, how are you doing? You're, you're off to New York, I think, fairly soon, but we've managed to catch you before then. Yeah, it's an interesting time. Um, I feel like I could, you know, it, it's a very healing thing to have gathered all of this work from 30 years of work and 50 years of life into this object, and it's sort of a relief. <laughs> Someone at lunch the other day said to me, like they often do, there was two people, who, I didn't know them, and they said, what do you do? I was like, oh, God, do I have to explain it? And I had a copy of the book, and I just plonked it on their plate. I, and I said, look, you read that. I'm going to go and get my food. And once you've read it, you'll know what I fucking do. And, and, and I won't have to explain it anymore. <laughs> I think it's like, it's like the best business card in the world, isn't it? It's just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's building up my muscles. So. <laughs> um, well, listen, you mentioned 50 years of life and 30 years of, of your career. I wanted to start by going way back to the beginning, because you studied, uh, studied theatre design, and I just wanted to know what it was about that course in particular that really appealed to you, and why you wanted to do that, that in the very first place. It's a really good question. Um, when I was, I guess, um, you know, choosing what subjects to study, I sort of ruled out the ones I couldn't do, because I was crap at them. Like... <laughs> quite a lot of them and then I thought okay well I, I can do art I can do English literature I can do that and there was a group of people from my school who were going to art school but I just didn't feel like I was ready I didn't feel like I had anything to say yet and all these people who were ready to go to art school they were so ready to express themselves and to speak and to give opinions and I I felt like I still had a lot to learn. So I went to university and I studied books. I just read English literature, I read books for three years. And of course, the more I read, the more I wanted to make. So I spent a lot of the time making things. I, I lived in this flat and it had shag pile carpet on the floor and all up the bath. So I peeled up the carpet and painted pictures everywhere. And I thought the landlord might be pleased, <laughs> but he wasn't. <laughs> and I had to paint over it all and put the carpet back. But I, I was constantly, sometimes, I don't know if any of you feel this, but sometimes when you make yourself do one thing, you're sort of daring yourself to do the other. I don't know if anyone else feels that. And I was sort of making myself read when all I really wanted to do was make. Um, anyway, finally, I'd finished that course and I was still no nearer to having an idea of what I wanted to do. And somebody said to me, after I'd done a foundation course, you know, most people do their foundation course at 18. I was already 22. I was a mature student. And someone said, you know, why don't you try theater design? I was like, well, theater design? I, like, I don't, theater's quite boring. I don't really like it, you know. <laughs> it's a bit embarrassing, you know, there's people singing and the music, I don't like it. <laughs> and, um, and they said, yeah, but you should go and visit this course. So I went into this room and I just felt at home there. It was like I had been, it was like people doing what I had been doing since I was a kid, cutting things up, starting with words, starting with music, making three-dimensional models, staying up all night, and... Interestingly, the course that I went to closed down, but it's just started up again, and it is called Genesis Theatre Design Course, and it is exclusively for low-income and global majority students, mm. specifically 
to try to balance our practice, which is imbalanced at the moment. And it's a really exciting course, if anyone's interested. That sounds amazing. Yeah, I didn't realize that. Um, had you previously, I mean, it sounds like you were a very creative child and adolescent and <laughs> uh, young adult. I mean, had you had a very creative upbringing? Because I have to say, before you know, preparing for this, I, I rewatched the Netflix abstract episode, and um, the producers Did go you see to my dad's tea cozies. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you, they go to your parents' house, and it's full of stuff that you know your dad's made, and he's like made a table and a tea cozy and stuff. Was there lots of making going on when you were a kid? Yeah, I mean, when I was growing up, you, we, you know, our family had a nice house, and we lived by the seaside. But well, there were four kids. My mum was a teacher. My dad was a journalist. And certainly, if you wanted to give someone a present, you had to make it. Uh, you weren't going to go and buy it, <laughs> you know. And, you know, so we made stuff. Um, and there was only three channels on the telly. In fact, my mum got rid of the telly. I'll tell you quite a funny story. Um, we really wanted a TV. And my my mum and dad didn't want us to have one because it was complicated. They had sort of ad adopted some other kids for a while. Not adopted, but they were looking after them for a while. So they had three teenagers plus their own four kids. And they didn't want the teenagers to be constantly watching the TV. So they got rid of it. And we were only allowed to watch TV on a Thursday night. And we'd go across to this girl, Cindy Simpson's house, Still and remember the name? Cindy Simpson, um, and we watched Tomorrow's World and Top of the Pops, and that was all we ever watched. Um, and eventually, we wanted a TV so much that we were quite crap at the violin and clarinet and piano. We played instruments quite badly, but we went busking wow. in Tunbridge Wells, and, and we made a bit of money, and we bought a TV, and we gave it to my parents for Christmas <laughs> <laughs> as a gift. <laughs> so my dad was quite happy so we sort of got a telly in the end but all I'm trying to say is there wasn't much to do you know we lived in a in a little country town in Rye near Sussex in Sussex and you know we made stuff and we didn't have many materials so we used cardboard boxes and nonsense like that and we just pieced things together so yeah I mean it does feel like Whenever I've seen you talking about your work, making feels very natural and like something you've been doing since you were yeah, mm. tiny. So that makes sense. I guess from that theatre design um, course, you then, I guess a lot of your first projects were at the Bush Theatre in Shepherd's Bush, which is a theatre of 78 seats, I think. Or, I don't know if it still is, but it, was, it certainly was. Actually, the seats are a bit like the ones you're sitting now. Has anyone got anyone's foot kicking into their bottom? <laughs> that was like, that's what it was like at the Bush Theatre. It was that kind of vibe. It's quite nice, though, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's quite well. cosy. I mean, actually, yeah. I've never... You, know, you guys have to tell me afterwards, but... Are um, you all right? Yeah. Comfortable? <laughs> it's yeah. Okay. Um, but what, I guess, like, working in such a small space really intimate space what did that teach you about the art of kind of stage design when I made my first projects at the Bush Theatre I did like five of them in a row in that room and what I learned was to have a relationship with one small room the room became one of the actors uh, the room became a protagonist in the work and I developed a relationship with that room and I could reach the ceiling, I could climb up on a ladder and change the light bulb myself. I could stay up all night, I had the keys to the theatre so I could paint it, make stuff. And I learned how much magic. And, and, and also this was a time in British film history when films were particularly underfunded. So quite a few young writers were really writing film scripts that they couldn't get made. So they would write a script with like 64 scenes. It'd be like, okay, we're in the park, now we're in the bedroom, now we're in the pub, you know. And, and you couldn't, you didn't have the option to try and make a real bedroom or make a, so it made you think in a more uh, lateral way about how to evoke place and how important was place anyway. I mean, because you, you used a lot of projection, I think, then, right? Or this was, I know that you did at um, the National when you did Harold Pinter's portrayal. That was when you used a lot of projection, I remember you saying at one point. And um, I guess on reflection, you said it didn't really need that. I think your, the quote you had was like, it's a very happy play in a white box, and you'd thrown a lot of projection onto it. And 
I guess how much of your work now do you feel like is about maybe self-editing, re refining things, selecting rather than throwing everything at a project like you did like at that, at that, with that project? I mean, um, I think it's a really good question around how do you self-edit? Um, what, what does something really need? Mm. Uh, and that just takes time to learn. And I'm really glad that I didn't self-edit too much at the beginning. Um, I'm really glad that I was so hungry to try things and to, you know, be a bit too much. Some of the plays, what, what I meant by that comment was in theater, I became a bit too much. You know, I, I would just like chuck everything at it. And it was like, why don't you go off and do pop music? You know, because I was almost rejected. Not, no, I wasn't rejected, but it was, it was a better pre place for me to put that energy probably in the end. It, it was better accommodated in music by the, by the sort of early 2000s. I mean, you've worked with, you know, you've done some enormous shows for the likes of Beyonce, as I mentioned, and, and many other enormous names in the, in the music world. Do you think you could have done that work without that grounding in theatre? I mean, I want to come on to that work, but it's just interesting, like, how, how much do you feel like that influence of, of the early work, I guess, in theatre? It's a really good question. Now that I run my studio and I have, you know, eight designers practicing with me, um, I feel it's really important that when we do theatre and opera projects, everyone in the studio has a go at them. Because what you learn from the um, focus and the rigor and the limitation of theatre, um, I think, steals you and hones your thinking in a very specific way. Which means when you go on and you have a big budget and there are far fewer parameters, you've built up a muscle in how to think with some rigor um, and to root yourself always in what do we really need and what does it mean. Um, otherwise, there's a real danger, as some of you, I don't know if many of you here practice um, in music or if you practice in you know, creative making in any way, but th there are so many invitations for us to make things without too much meaning. Um, and, and certainly what my, my team learned, as I learned, is every single gesture must be intolerant of a lack of meaning. That's an amazing phrase, yeah, no. And I guess if you have, if you were immediately given a massive budget, you wouldn't necessarily know to do that, right? You could, because anything is possible, you could almost go in any direction. Yeah, you maybe lose that, that, that meaning. Well, in a lot of the other areas that I practice in, often the first thing is, well, well what do you want to make, not why do you want to make it? You know, and, and what, what materials do you want to use or what equipment do you want to use? And that's all sort of irrelevant until you know what you want to say and why and who's it for and how is it going to actually be worth saying and in what way is it going to change people's minds in any way? How is it going to touch them? Otherwise, it's not, none of the rest of it means anything. So that's what the grounding in, in this type of small-scale work, that was a Bush Theatre piece there. That was a really early dance piece. So that, that grounding w was important and still is. You've collaborated, I mean, we've mentioned a few of the names, but yeah, you've collaborated with some of the biggest names in pop music, music generally. Um, you once described it as saying you, you've, you've found willing collaborators who you've been able to align your paths of inquiry with, which is a lovely way of thinking about it. How much do you lead that collaboration from the beginning and how much do you let them lead it? I'm really interested in what that looks like at the start of a project and as it, as it kind of continues. It's a, it's a really good question, and it's one I get asked quite a lot because um, there's a really, a really interesting, I think, uh, fascination with who decides what, where did the idea come from, who's telling who what to do, what's the hierarchy, who's the boss, you know. And honestly, the, the outcome is the boss. The show is the boss, you know. And, and, and after a while, that starts to become clear when you're, any of you who've experienced this, when you're ideating in collaboration, or as one of my friends in the book, Chris Heath, calls it in collision, because sometimes it's a collaboration and sometimes it's a crash <laughs> and a collision. And the outcome can be equally valid, whether that feels like a collaboration or a crash collision. You know, they, they can both pr produce a worthwhile thing. But the 
as you start doing it, you begin to have a sense of what's possible. The, the Venn diagram overlap between your batch of poems, your personal story, line of inquiry, area of interest, and your collaborators. And after a while, you tune your gaze in and you can see this hovering overlap where you might just find common ground. But you have to find new language every time and you have to trust. It's like one of those, you know those cartoons where Mickey Mouse or whoever steps over the cliff and they just stand on air for a minute before they fall? You, ha you just have to trust that you're drawing a line around something and you don't know where the line is gonna end. If you already know what shape you're drawing, then you know, you're not developing your craft, probably. The idea of like a kind of creative, productive tension, I think is something that I, looking through your, your work, it feels like it's there a lot of the time. Um, I guess there's, there's always this idea, or often this idea in your work, of this tension between kind of power and vulnerability. It seems to crop up a lot. Um, why is that a kind of theme you return to, you know, from theatre to these kind of incredibly celebrated celebrity artists that you work with? Um, I guess, is it about expressing something in the artist or is it more about how it makes the audience feel? Where, where, what, what are you kind of thinking about when you look at that tension? I, I, I've only started thinking this lately, but a thought I've been having lately is this, is that working in big music presentations, concerts, stadiums, sphere, um, really that form of large-scale concert is only really 60 years old. And it began in 1965 with the Beatles. Really, it began with them on telly. Because TV had just really begun to be in everybody's homes. And they were the first band to have this TV intimate reach. So they're, in every, they're the first band to be in everybody's bedroom. Or probably TVs weren't in bedrooms by then, but to be in everyone's living room. They were the first band that penetrated into people's homes like that. So when a young person who was a fan and felt that intimate connection with the Beatles and with their music and with their faces and their hair and their clothes, when they bought a ticket to Shea Stadium, which was the first ever stadium tour in, well, it wasn't a tour, it was a one-off in 1965, they thought they were buying a ticket to that, what they felt when they saw the the film close up, the camera close up of those four boys, men on TV. They thought that's what they were buying a ticket to. But of course they weren't. They were buying a ticket to a stadium. They couldn't see anything. They couldn't hear anything. No one had figured out how to protect a band in a stadium and how to, you know, augment the sound or show the face. So in fact, it was a dangerous situation. The band weren't safe because they were you know, kind of threatened by a mob that were disappointed because they had bought a ticket to intimacy and they were at a kind of riot. Couldn't see, couldn't hear. So in a way, everything that the art form's been doing since 1965, it's only 60 years, mm -hmm. is to try to you know, ameliorate that. And any of you who go to pop concerts know that there's still a way to go mainly what you feel when you arrive in a stadium is, okay, this is a sporting environment that's trying to be a place of communion and art, but I still smell the sportiness of it. And the main thing that you take away is, oh shit, there's a lot of people being up all night putting some gear up. You know, it's a load of truss, it's a load of lights, it's gear. And you know that that gear got up there with a load of machines and men up ladders and up genies or whatever they were doing, but it's industrial touring gear. And, and so much of the work that I try and do is to mitigate against that, like what's the medicine? And actually this one at the Sphere has been a bit of a revelation. Of course, there's lots of things that we could critique about it, but what I will say is it, you can't see the gear. You know, the speakers are behind the screen. And that's a bit of a revelation, actually. And it's made for music. Hmm. I actually wanted to come onto The Sphere because it is quite incredible. And watching, you, you obviously worked on U2's show for The Sphere, which is that, that venue we just saw in, in Las Vegas. It was described somewhere as the, the best American invention of the past 10, 15 years or something, which, you know, 
you know, we, we can discuss. Um, but uh, just talk us through that, that project and I guess like what working make, what, making work, sorry, on that scale, what that's like and, and how it was different to anything you've, you've done before, I guess. Yeah, I mean, this, we were worried about doing the sphere. We were really worried um, about the amount of energy it consumes, about who is it for, um, what's it really about. And we made a decision that it's an inauguration of a new building. Um, and that can only happen once. And I've been fortunate enough to inaugurate three or four buildings now. And it's really special. The first time a building sings, the first time it hosts its guests, its audience, and it starts to define its character. And you may have doubts about every atom of emissions that went into building the building, that go into powering the building. What I will say about that one is they are committed to 70% solar power. It's not there yet, but they have made a public commitment to that, which is something which not all new developments, even of housing, let alone theatres and public buildings, is doing. Um, but we were able to launch it in a way that celebrated all the endangered species of Nevada, um, and became a group art show and included John Gerard, Marco Brambilla and Brian Eno and myself making artwork. So if you're going to inaugurate a building, I felt it was done right and people are, are, feel, are enjoying it. So. And it looks amazing. I mean, it looks like kind of nothing, it, completely out of this world. Um, you spoke about how, I guess, like stadium gigs and, and you know, concerts generally have changed over the past... 60 years, or, or certainly since, since the Beatles. Um, you've also mentioned before about how you used to design for the people in the audience, and there was probably one professional photographer there who was you know, very close up and taking pictures of the band, and that would be what memorialized that, that concert. Whereas now, obviously, we've all been to music gigs recently where everyone's got a phone out. How does that change how you think about the show? Does it change how you think about the show? Are you thinking about the fact that it's going to be, you know, each person has their own audience afterwards and is broadcasting to that audience? You know, do you have to think about the square screen and what it looks like from a bit further away, etc.? I don't, I don't design the show differently because of that, but um, there's no doubt that the artist sees their show from every angle. You know, before they were in the show, and now they do look at the footage after, so they know exactly, you know, they will give you notes and say, well, actually, from that seat over there, you know. So there's a real dem democratizing aspect to that. Um, I don't know. I think the phone thing at concerts is quite weird. Um, <laughs> I get it, but it does, it does have a weird atmosphere to it. It, it feels almost involuntarily, involuntary, the filming of a concert, and I wonder, I guess it's, it's just to sort of be, I guess people are in the moment and then they're also filming the moment so they can be in the moment again. Um, you know. Yeah, I've always thought that it kind of slightly diminishes from the, the being present in the moment when you're filming it, but maybe I'm just old fashioned, I don't know. I, I was actually at the weekend gig in um, the Olympic Park and the girl in front of me, she faced me for the whole gig. She wasn't looking at me, she was looking at her phone and she filmed the whole gig with herself in it. <laughs> Um, and I, I tend, to, I've really learned to not be judgmental about that <laughs> because I just think being judgmental is an uninteresting choice. So what I tend to do is I've tried to find a new word for selfie, which is self-portrait. And I think the art of taking a self-portrait is an honorable thing to do and an interesting thing to do. And it's something that people have always done. So I'm thinking of that girl and saying, okay, she was taking a moving self-portrait in which Abel <laughs> was behind her and she was filming herself enjoying the show. Um, that's my way of looking at it because I don't know how else to... <laughs> well, the worrying thing is that she could have been filming you the entire time. That's the, the real concern. <laughs> oh, I'm glad she wasn't doing that. <laughs> I guess a lot of the, the tricks that you play, I mean, tricks is a really, you know, yeah, reductive word for it, but you know, playing with light and scale, it kind of depends on the fact that the audience is often static and, and in one place, you know, viewing your work from, from one place. But you've recently done, I guess, more interactive and kind of fluid installations, um, you know, that an audience can walk through, engage with. How does that change how you think about something when the audience perspective is, is moving, it's not, it's not static? I mean, I've got a real, 
I've got a real admiration for audiences. Like, I mean, I did mention this earlier that you guys all queued up and you're all sitting here and you're all really politely and engagedly putting all of your attention to us here, which I think is a really beautiful thing. And I think it's more and more rare and unusual. And I was, you know, highlighting that to Matt, that you have this beautiful big audience coming to, to be part of this conversation. Um, and so people sitting still, there's a way, um, Lindsay Turner, who's a theater director I work with, she puts it really well. She describes what's happening in a theater. She says, the performers pretend that the audience are not there. The audience pretend that they're not there. And we all agree to do this at precisely 7.30. We, we still our ego for the greater good. And I thought, wow, such a beautiful way of putting it and so unusual that we decide, it, it, I mean, I cannot tell you how fragmented I often feel by my little hand going to my little phone. I'm reading a book and the little hand, I was like, what, what are you doing there, hand? <laughs> well, why are you at my phone? I, I was on this page. Why, why are you there? Why are you checking your stupid Instagram? You know? So we constantly feel fragmented and we're, our species is in a moment of wrestling with that in all sorts of ways. So therefore, the gathering of an audience and sitting still and focusing is a beautiful thing. Equally, there's a really lovely moment. If you could say to this audience right now, okay, we finished the talk, that was all cool. We're gonna cut a hole in this screen and you can walk in. And everything that you just saw here, you're, you're fine behind that. And so I've started making installations like that, mm -hmm. where I make a little film and then I make a hole in it or I open a door in it and I say, okay, you, you've sat quietly, we've looked at this together, now, now you go in. And I think that moment of shift from focus, engagement, the stilling of the ego for the greater good into agency and determination yourself for how you're gonna proceed through the next bit. And then a final sort of act when you step out, like, well, how will this affect my thinking? How will this change me? What will, what, what will I read? What will be my next? line of inquiry from this? How will I build on this? Those are the three pieces I'm now really interested in. Fascinating, yeah. We've talked a little bit about technology, obviously the sphere and smartphones. I'm interested, have you been interested in creating spaces in VR? Have you been asked to do it? What's your thoughts on that? I guess, are you, do you think in the future you might be making work for people wearing VR headsets sitting at home or is that not a world you want to be in? Before it goes, if you were going to ask about AI, mm. these are the, those were, the last two pieces were the collective poetry works. Um, a building 22 meters high that wrote a new poem every 90 seconds. Mm. It could have written one every one second, but we weren't fast enough to read it, so we slowed it down. Um, and the previous one was um, Nelson's Column and a Christmas tree-ish thing at the V&A both of which were made of collective poems. Yeah. Um, VR, um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've tried, I've been in the shark thing with my son, I've put it on. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I remember that, the VR I really enjoyed, I haven't made any, the VR I really enjoyed was um, when JR did it, he made a beautiful VR piece, and it was one of those ones where it was with a Sunday newspaper supplement, I think it was the New York Times, mm -hmm. and you got a cardboard, of course I loved it because it was cardboard and you made it yourself, so you folded this cardboard thing and then you slotted your phone into the cardboard box and you put the cardboard box on your face. So you stuck your phone to your face. <laughs> Perfect, yeah. <laughs> and that's how you watched it. Do, do you ever, anyone remember that? That's how you did it, right? You stuck yeah. your phone on your face. And um, it was really clever because it, the whole film was an interview between JR and the camera. And it was all about this magnificent piece he made in New York um, with the one um, immigrant walking that he had overnight pasted to the ground. Uh, I think it was a young Syrian gentleman who, um, you couldn't see when you walked over him, so people walked over him all day. 
And then JR went up into a helicopter. And the one moment they actually used the VR technique, really, was when he looked down. And you were wearing the glasses and you looked down. And it was as if you were in the helicopter with him and you looked down and you could see this magnificent man striding like the biggest man in New York. And he, that moment of making this ignored, invisible figure magnificent, I thought, well, that's a really brilliant use of this technology. Um, so I guess, yeah, if I have an idea that wants to do that, I will. Mm. But for now, I guess, yeah, I'm, I'm very into the communal aspect of things, that how people sit together, how people's bodies behave together. So anything that isolates, I'm more interested in AR glasses than VR glasses, right. I guess. So. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, interesting. Um, I want to also talk about, well, the book that's between us, because it is your first monograph, An Atlas of Ez Devlin. It's coming out soon. It's published uh, uh, by yeah, Thames and Hudson in association with a retrospective exhibition you've got opening at the Cooper Hewitt in, uh, in New York later this month. It's 900 pages. It has over 700 color images. It is amazing. I've just had a, a look through it. And yeah, it is absolutely incredible. Can you just tell us a little bit about how it came together, how long it's taken to bring together, um, and yeah, what it was like to work on something this, this incredible and massive? <laughs> I was trying to make a book for seven years, um, and I feel really happy that I've finished it. <laughs> and my family are really happy that I'm not doing the bloody book anymore. It's done. Um, but it, I kept trying to make it, and every version I made, because in my studio we would piece it together, print it out, stick it together, make a mock-up, because I was like, I don't understand any of this flat band business. I need a book. So they kept making it. We've got like 20 of these, big ones, small ones, tiny ones, giant ones, thick ones. But every time I organized the material, it was a bit exhausting because I kept arranging it by project, going, you know, this was a bit of text about it, here's some sketches, here's some more sketches, and here's the picture of the work, and then I did that again, 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 in about 260 projects, and it, it was just like going breakfast, lunch, dinner, breakfast, lunch, dinner, breakfast, lunch, and you just wanted to vomit, and it was, it was sort of, you know, you looked at it and you went, wow, Ez has been busy, you know, it, it, you, you didn't particularly feel nourished or any kind of arc of, well, what does that mean for me? And I, I only wanted to make the book if it was going to be of use to someone who had it in their hand, um, as well as it's obviously of massive use to me because I've spat it out, so I feel <laughs> great, but it, well, that wasn't really enough. Um, so I found a way to arrange it, um, which I think actually works. It's you sit with me in the studio for the first sort of two thirds of the book and I sort of tell little stories and you only see things that I've made with my hand. And then you enter into the work, the photographs, and then they're arranged in what I hope is quite a palatable, digestible way because they're first organized by form and then by color. So you kind of flow through them without feeling too tired mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> or too overwhelmed. And you, and you hope, I hope, what it's done for me is help me find threads through my own practice. And what I really help it does, well, you know, you don't have to buy the book, you can look at the website or something, but I really hope that my example is helpful to any one of you who applies your art. Because I think so many of us, we, find we have some skill or some sensibility in art, and we put that in service of things we're invited to do. So many of us are applied artists. And then we look back and go, but, but you know, I didn't choose to do all those things. I agreed with some of them. I didn't agree with others. There was always compromise. Was it really my idea? So few of us work with absolute purity from start to finish on an idea. And I guess what the book proves, and hopefully what my practice proves, is that you can look back over your own practice as an applied artist and find your own thread that actually, in the end, represents you and your identity. And you can gather that into an album and say, well, actually, there was a kind of line inquiry. Mm. There was a logic to that. And that's really healing and helpful 
to sort of look at your own purpose and your own identity. And I hope that's what people feel when they look at it. It's an amazing book. Yeah, I mean, it's, it feels so rich. Like, uh, yeah, I feel like you could read it for years and come back to it and still find new things in it. It's so dense and rich. Um, it's brilliant. And yeah, perfectly in time for Christmas. So yeah, I think people should buy it, not just go on the website. But um, I've taken up a lot of time, so I'm, we're going to have a few questions that were submitted by the audience now. Um, we can do them quick fire. But um, we had a question from Joe Hyman. How do you apply your design principles to smaller scale events? Where is Joe? Oh, Put your hand up, here. Joe. You have to stand up, <laughs> because I can hardly see anything. Um, Joe! Hello, Joe. Thanks for asking the question. <laughs> what was it again? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> how, do you, how do I apply it to smaller scale? That's it, yeah. Um, I, I, I think with determination and... Um, knowledge that it doesn't matter how small the scale is. I mean, I still, you know, this book is quite a small scale thing. I've never put so much bloody effort into anything, <laughs> and it's small scale. But in ter do you mean in terms of like a small, for yourself in a small scale theatre? Yeah. Um, <laughs> are, are, are you, go on, shout it out. Are you, are you a set designer? Do, what do you do? Okay, so when I worked at the Bush Theatre, which is quite small scale, the director there always used to say to me, big ideas for tiny spaces. And I, in a way, weirdly, if you are in a small space, um, trying to make one gesture, just one, in, and if you, if you have a budget of 50 quid, just say, well, how many of one thing can I get for 50 quid? It might be 50 bin bags, you know. Actually, there's an example in the book and, and maybe in the pictures um, of this, of um, a piece I did at the Royal Ballet. And I think the budget was 300 pounds for the set. Or maybe it was 3,000, I can't remember. It was, it was even, whatever it was, it was, three, it was too small. And <laughs> it, was small, it was a small number at the time. And I just said, it was 3,000 pounds. And I said, well, what, what can I have, you know, what can I have 300 of for 3,000 pounds? And we just had 300 white scaff bars, you know, and j just something like that. Just go, don't, just pick one gesture, one, and, and then think about what would be the gesture that would, you know, if it, that would most bring energy to the space. Even if you turn all the lights out because the room looks shit, the gesture is that you can't see anything and just, Think, do the sound. But just do one bold thing. That's my advice. Love it. <laughs> um, this question comes from M. Argiro. I, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, how do you deal with uh, maintaining creativity and uniqueness as budgets grow? So as the budgets get bigger, how do you still maintain creativity and uniqueness? Questioner, where are you? M. Argiro, are you here? Unclear. Are you over there? Hi. How are you? <laughs> Good, thank you. Thanks for asking the question. Um, that's, in a way, even a harder question than the previous one, I think. Because that's when things can get, you know, generalized, bloated, um, and generalized and bloated, again, <laughs> as you know. Um, so I think, again, the answer's quite similar. It's, it's what's the gesture? You know, even today I was having a conversation with a really intelligent director who said to me, oh, I thought the castle maybe should be like this, maybe it could be a bit like this. I was like, what are you talking about? I, I don't want to talk about what this fucking castle's like. What's the gesture? What, what's the sweep? What, what's the meaning? What are we trying to say? You know, because nothing else is worth bothering with. So I think as soon as you find yourself decorating and, you know, Try, trying to think about is it blue or is, if you're asking yourself the question should it be blue or should it be green then the, the foundational work of why it should even be there in the first place hasn't been done so I think the biggest recommendation I would give is if ever you find yourself yeah in one of those kind of decorating questions then dig a bit deeper because you're you're painting something that wasn't really built yet and go back to the root of why you're doing it anyway and is it actually worth doing and if it's not then 
don't do it unless you're being paid and then try and think of a really good reason for doing it better than the reason that you're being paid. My, a, a, friend, a friend said to that me, well, once I said to me, he said, why are you doing this? I said, oh, well, they're paying me. He said, that's a really crap reason for doing it. I said, yeah, but I need, he said, it's still a crap reason. He said, you, you may need to be paid, but you've got to find a better reason, an additional reason. And I've, that's really stuck with me. It's never good enough. Mm. Final question. Uh, this one's from Eilish Briscoe. Uh, what advice would you give to yourself when you started your career, knowing what you know now with Where, this amazing... Where's the questioner? Eilish? Again, sorry if I'm saying that wrong. Yay, hello. <laughs> Thanks for asking the question. Um, advice, say yes to everything. <laughs> Yes. Just say yes to absolutely everything at the beginning. Because everything you do, you'll learn from. You might learn that it was a crap idea to say yes, <laughs> but you won't learn unless you say yes. That's my advice. That's lovely. One final question from me. Um, you said that you bring people together in temporary societies, and you've, you've spoken this evening about how that communal aspect is something that you're really interested in. I mean, society can be quite a tricky thing to get right. I guess we've all seen that in recent years. What do you make the kind of ideal temporary society? I think there's a lot in that question. Um, I think the fact that everyone sits down together um, with respect and quietness and respecting, stilling, stilling, each stilling their ego that's already ideal mm. um, that we talked about earlier. Um, I think the fact that we come in as a group of people and we leave as a slightly different group of people and we all went through one experience. You know, if we've all been singing together, we all left having, you know, a rap brought to life that part of our brain that sang that particular note. I guess what I would mainly say is what we're doing t this evening and what you're talking about, temporary societies, gathering for, you know, shared experiences, rituals, this has always been our birthright, like going to sleep or eating. This has always been something that you did to remind yourself that you were human. And it's only in this odd moment of current Western society that we consider it remotely something you do on a special night out. You know, ritual would have been just a weekly habit in every other culture and society till now. So I tend to think, and, and also synesthetic ritual, the idea that you would go to a room where you would smell the incense, you would see the light coming through the windows, you would hear the music, you would hear the poetic texts, and you would be in communion with people. That has happened in every society, in every age, until about 500 years ago. So I would say, and, and none of it used to be called art. It was just called the ritual, the thing you did, the gathering, whatever. So I would say that where we are now is more of an aberration from how it has always been. And I think the more we can all, you know, as we move forward and make our work and, you know, gather, as everyone's doing here and going to, going to things together, turning our phones off, being unfragmented, being focused, coming away changed. That's us slightly reinstating what has always been our birthright, I think. That's a lovely message to end on. I'm afraid we've definitely used up all of our time, but thank you so, so much, Ez. Can we all have a huge round of applause? There's Devlin, thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you.